So you think it was boring during the Middle Ages? No electronics, no phones, nothing. Well, they knew how to entertain themselves, believe me, with body humor. Please join me in welcoming in today's UCF imprinted Dr. Tyson Pugh, English department professor and expert on all things medieval and racy. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about the first time I had to be have any ex exposure to Chaucer, it must have been in high school, mm -hmm. and I remember one kid saying, there's only two words worth reading in the whole thing. <laughs> what were those two? I can't imagine. Okay. <laughs> and the Miller's Wife. Oh, uh, the Miller's Tale. So The Miller's mm -hmm. Tale, you know, it, and to, to kids, that's the only thing we looked for was the body part because it was so difficult to to look at the well, middle. Your, your mid teachers were probably hiding it from you then. I think so. And that's unfortunate <laughs> because so much of the greatness of medieval literature is it's, it has such a sense of the, the real ways in which humor comes from the body. And body humor is related to the fact that the body is beyond our control and puts us into all sorts of uh, horribly embarrassing situations. With, and it's really funny. Yes, <laughs> with, with farts and other such things. That just that are, was one of the words. Well, the, the, <laughs> the Miller's Tale has the best fart in all of literature. <laughs> To this date, I have not seen a better fart. And I, I don't know if people join me in the quest for the better literary fart, but they might as well give what up. About the, it's the, what about those, those who are watching who have never actually read it? Oh, oh Can goodness. Can you help us? Help us with it. Why, why, what makes that, that, that toot, as we say uh, with the, our children? The toot, I'm sorry. If I'm, <laughs> That's okay. okay. What makes that fart better than all others? <laughs> well, it, it's the way that it comes That's the climax of the story. And it's, it's delivered in uh, just an almost Seinfeldian moment of every storyline coming together. And so um, it, it's the fart that is also the blast of humor, but also of humor being resolved. And uh, Chaucer knew how to pace his stories. He knew how to set the comic climaxes up so well that it's, it's it's such a surprise that it comes, but of course it makes perfect sense, perfect narrative sense. There's nothing else that could really end the story as well as a fart. <laughs> so this is this is why I love Chaucer. This is what what his great strength is. Do you know what I love? I love how he writes a disclaimer about uh -huh. the the as if it wasn't coming from him. Right. You know, be very careful. Sure. With this. <laughs> sure. Well, the end of the uh, Canterbury Tales is his. Uh, uh, recount, I'm um, sorry, uh, not, not recounting, but disclaimer that the, this is, he had to tell the story as he heard it. Right, right? it's the Miller's fault. Right, exactly, it's <laughs> the Miller's fault. Of course, ignoring the fact that it's a work of fiction that he created, there was no Miller. <laughs> and so he's apologizing for the truth of the Miller, which is the truth of his own lies. So his own lies in fiction. So it creates quite a convoluted little mess that he has to extricate himself from at the and end. And there are probably plenty of people who thought, well, you know, it was that darn Miller. It wasn't Chaucer's fault. How nice he was to oh, warn oh, us. Oh, oh, what fools they would be. <laughs> you know, and it just shows that they need to come to my class very quickly. Immediately, uh, sign so, up. Yes. Now, what was your aha moment? You know, it, it when was, you said, this is what I love, I love this. Well, I hate to keep us on such the a Miller's. low level, <laughs> but it, it was in an undergraduate course reading The Miller's Tale. And the thought that uh, my professor could come into a class and, and talk about medieval farts and get paid for it <laughs> was rather eye-opening. It, it's somewhat sad about my uh, emotional development, <laughs> but I, in some ways I still have the sense of humor of a 12-year-old. And the thought that I could make a career out of teaching others about 12-year-old adolescent humor and dressing it up in this, this great beauty that Chaucer's language gives it. It's, it's really such a fantastic mix of high and low culture all at once. But how lucky you are to still have that. I think I'm pretty that. lucky. To still have that humor and to introduce your, right. your, your students must adore you. <laughs> uh, well, I won't speak for them. I, I'm sure they're the, the voices of, of uh, disagreement there. I, I hope uh, they enjoy the class. As, I mean, I, I think it's true. You can certainly not like me. I can respect that decision in a lot of ways. But sh how could you not like Chaucer? That would be, that's, you're depriving yourself of that pleasure. So that, that led you down the path of medieval literature. Yes. Just, it was, you, you actually knew at that point. It, it, there were some other flirtations. I liked Dickens a lot. And so I thought about uh, specializing in Victorian literature. And I love, uh, 
the just insane violence of <laughs> Renaissance drama. And so I thought about specializing in the Renaissance as well. But it really was the, the humor of the Middle Ages, that, uh, that siren song in the end I couldn't ignore. You talk about the humor of the Middle Ages, and I, I admitted to you when we first talked about the show that, oh, I think the only medieval education I have is Monty Python of the Holy Grail. Well, what a fantastic <laughs> way to start your education because you, you've gone to the very best teachers of the medieval period that I think we have today. All of the Monty Tr Python troupe, they know their Middle Ages. They, uh, you know, I can't recount their degrees exactly, but I'm pretty sure all of them studied at Cambridge and Oxford in history and literature. Uh, I can't uh, really uh, document that with their dates of graduation and such, but they knew the Middle Ages and that's what makes their movies so fantastically funny, is that they're making fun of it with the knowledge of what the literatures really were like. I don't think and people so, really understand how educated they were and how yeah. much goes into their work. Well, people should watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail and just infuse it into their system because it's so outrageously funny. But then they should read Sir Gowan and the Green Knight and see the ways in which uh, Galahad's adventures at the Castle Anthrax directly mirror Gowan's adventures at Bertilak's court in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. And to see the ways that uh, Mallory's Mort Arthur is so influential and in their uh, treatment of Lancelot and his rescue of Prince Herbert, who, who just wants to sing. <laughs> What's wrong with that? And you know, it's so real, too. The, the actual cinema of it is so real. They certainly didn't pretty it up as, no. as maybe Camelot. No, you know, no. Camelot, they were all perfumed and beautiful yes. and quaffed. <laughs> but the great fun of Monty Python is that, that mixture of the high and low. Uh, it's probably a line I can't quote on this show, but they see King Arthur moving through the village and ask, how do you know he's the king? Well, he's the only one with insert the word for excrement, <laughs> without that on him. <laughs> and that, that's a perfect way to, to sum up the disparities in medieval culture. I mean, it's very, it's, it's at the same time that it's very funny, there's, there's a good deal of truth there, too. And medieval culture is really what, what made medieval literature come about. It really speaks a lot about relationships, about women's place in society and everything right. that was going on with that because it's almost, the medieval literature is almost like a history lesson. In some ways. I mean, it's a history lesson you have to take with a grain of salt. I mean, think of George Washington and the cherry tree, right? In some ways, history and legend intertwine to tell a, a truth that's in some ways bigger than the actual truth, right? It's more, it's more important to have this lesson about George Washington being so honest, he would never, you know, he would immediately fess up to cutting down the cherry tree. And so you have to look through medieval literature through, through a lens, trying to filter out where is history, where is fiction in it. And I mean, one example might be Chaucer's Wife of Bath. Uh, a lot of people want to see her in her outrageous excess and the way that she resists all of the patriarchal structures around her and her, her excessive marriages, her rampant sexuality. I mean, she's, just, she's had five husbands and welcoming the sixth whenever he might come along. Mm -hmm. And some people try to read her as an early feminist. And, but we have to think about what does that mean in a society where there wasn't really an idea of feminism. And so mm -hmm. there's an idea of resistance to uh, structures, political structures that might put a woman in a, a certain place. But does that then translate and make her into a kind of a proto-feminist figure? It's, 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 it's an interesting thought. Yeah. And also there are the, the, the whole institution of marriage mm -hmm. throughout medieval literature is, right. uh, from, from what it is, appears to me, and please, you're the expert, so please correct me if sure. I'm wrong, is that really it was the older men who had the money and wherewithal to take on the wives. And isn't and the that younger, funny? <laughs> can <you> imagine <laughs> where that would happen? <laughs> and the younger men didn't have the money for sure. them and they were all jealous of each other. Right. <laughs> Yes. Well, and uh, that's that's one of the one of Chaucer's favorite plot devices is to have an old man with a younger woman, because hum hilarity ensues with that. And so it's not just in the Miller's tale you have that; it's in the Merchant's tale too. And in in that tale you have May who marries uh, January, and so we say May December romance. Chaucer has May January. <laughs> same same difference. And the the real humor of that is seeing her satisfy her own desires with the squire Damien at the expense of her husband. And oh, oh, that's just such a great 
I always have so much fun looking at that with my class because it's the most disgusting <laughs> sexual scene in all of literature. Chaucer has a lot of the greatest moments in all of literature. We've already discussed his best fart. But the, the best <laughs> purposefully disturbing sex scene between an old man and a young woman yeah, so. And so your kids really like that? Oh, well, I do. And <laughs> you like watching I, I, their reactions. I hope reaction. they do too. You know, again, if, if they don't like Chaucer, I just don't quite know what to do with them. And you don't know yeah. what to do with them. And so I, mean, I, I try to bring it in so many different ways, and I think uh, most of the students get on board for it. It's difficult, though. Reading Middle English is a challenge. Right? I mean, That's what I was going to say because I remember I usually put off by, oh, this is so hard. Right, I, I can't get hard. through this. <laughs> well, that's why you get college credit for it at UCF, <laughs> right? It's very difficult. If it, if it were easy, why would the state of Florida pay me to do this? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. And so the first few weeks of the class, we spend on some vocabulary lessons, some pronunciation lessons, just uh, basic exercises to get them kind of imbibing Middle English. And one of the things that I point out to them is this is true, they have to do something equivalent to this with pretty much all of their courses. Right. Uh, a Victorian class, uh, you might understand all of the words on the page, but you have to read 800 pages of them for each novel. For a modernism class, you might understand each word on the page, but they're put together in a very confusing stream of conscience and a style that you know takes time to get used to and to learn. So it's just it's the it's the hard thing about the Chaucer class uh, to to pick up Chaucer's language, but it can be done. Most students by the end of the third week are have the level of fluency they need to succeed in the class. When you first had your aha with Chaucer, did you ever think you would be a writer writing about a writer? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a strange field, and uh, I, I have to admit, I didn't realize that professors had to write criticism until I got to graduate school. I didn't realize that was part of the deal. Uh, but it, it's, it's a lot of fun, too, because you get to really think about the ways in which your favorite writer is tackling the issues of his or her world. And another thing that I like to uh, do work on is contemporary films and how they use the Middle Ages to kind of work through our own contemporary issues. You, you, were, you were mentioning some of them. Give me, give me some, some, some examples so everybody can say, oh, yeah. Oh, oh dear. Well, I, I don't know if anyone's seen them. <laughs> but, uh, they, and they shouldn't, because one of them's really bad. A Kid in King Arthur's Court. It was a 95, maybe right. 96 Disney film. Mm -hmm. And uh, not, not a great movie, but it just was really interesting to me, the ways in which they used the Arthurian legend to address issues of contemporary gender roles. And so in this movie, you have the, the, the young male protagonist, and he, he strikes out at baseball. He's kind of the loser kid who can't do anything. But We've all felt like that at some point, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but you know, by going back to King Arthur's court, he's able to kind of reclaim the masculinity that he can't have in the 20th century. And then the other really interesting thing about that movie is you might expect a movie about King Arthur's court to have the character of Guinevere, but she's surprisingly absent <laughs> from this film. And I think because uh, Guinevere doesn't really belong in a movie about for, for children because it sets up the dissolution of Arthur's court with the adultery with Lancelot and they right. don't want to deal with with that for kids. And you talked about, we talked about earlier before the show that people people's fascination with medieval times has sure. to do with the death of chivalry or the seemingly death of chivalry. Well, I, I think when people look back at the Middle Ages, they're looking for something they find lacking in contemporary culture, whether that's true or not. And so a place like medieval times allows people to kind of reimagine the past, and I mean, medieval times is a lot of fun, but it's it's certainly not the place to go to learn the <laughs> you know the historical veracity of the Middle Ages. Right. Uh, the the end of the show that I saw w brought out uh, the the mm -hmm. American flag for the triumphant knight, mm -hmm. and of course America didn't exist for a good couple of hundred years <laughs> after the Middle Ages. So historical veracity, no, but a good time and addressing what we want the Middle Ages to be for us today. I think a place like Medieval Times Honor does wonderfully. Honor chivalry. Honor and fighting chivalry. For fighting for one's yeah, rights. Fighting for noble causes that are bigger than, than, than oneself, yeah. You know, we were also talking about um, the times that this was written, you have to really understand how difficult it was to write the to printed write. word. Sure, sure, very difficult. I mean, you have to have, a, hardly anyone is educated. And so you have to have access 
to the written word to and the means of production, right? Uh, writing is very expensive. I mean, manuscript paper doesn't come cheap in this culture. Would they There's use a, parchment or vellum mm -hmm. made out of lamb? Right. Is that mm -hmm. what they, lamb skin, is that what they did? Mm -hmm. And so it's, you, you need an education that, you know, 95% of the population doesn't have, and you need the, the means of production that so much of the population doesn't have. And <clears throat> it's, uh, it's just interesting to see moments like when Chaucer writes to his scribe and you know, takes him to task for uh, taking his words down inter incorrectly and he wishes him a curse of scabies for, for that. So <laughs> Chaucer was, was not quite happy with the, the quality of the scribes around him. We talked about that it must have been some interview process. I probably didn't have a long line of I, scribes looking for I really work. don't know about the, the scribe <laughs> interview process. That's, that's, that'll how be do you my find next, one? <laughs> my, my next field of research will be how does one find a scribe in the period? I, I mean, he's, it was Chaucer lives in, you know, he's associated with Richard II's court, so he certainly circulated around a, a rarefied level of society. I had but, read hmm. something that there was uh, actually a possible th thought that maybe he was murdered by Richard oh, II's yeah, that, enemies. Or yeah, that, that theory's come out, and it's uh, Terry Jones is actually the one who wrote the book. And he, one of, of the course, Monty Python guys. One of the guys. Monty Python guys. I, I haven't seen that book yet. It just uh, came out very recently, but that is one of the new theories. Hmm, I can see the next movie now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also heard that, that bec because it was written on this lambskin, that they could actually scrape it off right. and rewrite, and they've actually found revisions and very sure. interesting things mm -hmm. in, in, in being able to analyze that with the technology today. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating field of uh, study right now, trying to recreate some of those lost works. But, and that, that's one of the great shames and disappointments of studying uh, medieval literature is that so much has been lost and doubtful. I mean, every now and then something wonderful is found in an attic in England or, or something like that, but uh, just so much great literature that we have from the period is, is just the tip of the iceberg of what was there at the of time. what was there. Yeah. How do you think the people heard it, and who, who heard it? Because obviously they, most of them couldn't read. Right. Uh, there would be I mean, one of the, the great uh, illustrations, my, one of, probably my favorite picture from all of the Middle Ages, is the frontispiece from Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida. And there's a picture of him standing in a circle and reading to the rest of the court. And so there's definitely, a, it was a world of oral performances and people would, you know, minstrels and such would come and perform different pieces. That would travel from place to mm -hmm. place. And that's what uh, the Canterbury Tales is kind of about a traveling story tellers. Well, they're, they're on their pilgrimage to Canterbury, so. And what, what a great cross section of society is, is on the way there. That's what's so wonderful about mm -hmm. it is that everybody is there and right. everybody has their story to tell in right. their own way. And they each represent their own interests and so there's a lot of infighting between the different classes and so uh, one of the, uh, with, without the, the story of the Canterbury pilgrimage, I don't think the Canterbury Tales would be nearly as good if they were just separate stories from Happening each other. at different places right. at different times. But how the pilgrims use their stories to assert their individuality against one another is, is really fantastic. Again, with the Miller's Tale, the Miller's Tale tears, tears down the structures of the knight's tale. And so the Miller uses his tale to say to the knight what he can't say in real life, which is, you know, I think what you just said is a load of bunk. <laughs> it's a bunch of hooey. Right, you know, and so I'm gonna, t I'm gonna retell your tale, but I'm gonna tell it very differently and show you what I think of it and you know, turning it upside down. Everything that you hold dear, I'm gonna make fun of in my, my own tale. Was and Chaucer, that happens throughout the Was pilgrimage. Chaucer the first, uh, <coughs> first me. medieval um, writer who wrote in English? No, no, we certainly had. The most, the most acknowledged? Well, uh, the 14th century, the, the big names are Chaucer and Langland, who wrote Pierce Plowman, and uh, the anonymous author of Sir Gowan the Green Knight, Pearl, Patience, and Cleanness. And um, there was much more going on in France, though, wasn't there? Uh, there's a lot going on in France, and you know, in, in some ways, England is still seen as the hinterlands in the 14th century. I mean, uh, the the continental culture is where culture is, and it, it takes England a long time to to shed its kind of identity as a cultural backwater. But Chaucer did a good good job with that. But of course, one of the things again that makes him 
such a fascinating literary figure is the way that he uses the Italian tradition, the French tradition in his own writings. And that's what great writers do. Right. They pull, exactly. from, pull from everything around them. Mm -hmm. And give it then their own unique voice. And there's right. also different ways of looking looking at things that were written a long time ago. A lot of your a lot of your study is looking into the real male female, male male relationships sure. that maybe people were not taking a look at at that time. Right of the homosexuality that, that may have been suggested or, or sure. actually meant to be in these, in these great books. It, it's a fascinating topic of study. I mean, uh, one, one group of poets that I've worked on are 12th century uh, French poets who write in Latin, Marbeau of Rand, Baudry of Bourgay, and Hildebert of Laverdin. And <clears throat> they write in almost two different voices. And one of the voices condemns uh, homosexuality condemns male-male relationships with, you know, threats of hellfire and all of that. And then another voice says, oh my gosh, <laughs> that, that guy is hot. <laughs> and it, it's just a really fascinating mixture of... Or is it thou is hot? How would you oh, say well, it in the video? <laughs> you know, well, you, you say it in Latin, that so Latin. I'm translating okay. uh, <laughs> rather loosely, but uh, I'd be happy to, to share the poems with you at some point. But I think that, that shows a, a real deep ambivalence about what uh, different sex acts and sex partners can say at a given moment. I mean, they, they obviously felt safe to write that, you know, homosexuality, same-sex acts are bad, but then they also felt very comfortable writing to each other, and some of these are, are called letters, they're poetic letters, so that also, also puts a sort of difficulty interpretation, who were they written to and such. But in these letters, they talk about, you know, uh, the beauty of the male body in highly eroticized terms. And so, you know, is, is there a contradiction here or not? I think there is a, a play with persona. Authors often adopt different personas based upon different rhetorical situations. And also and maybe that, based upon who they think would be reading it. Exactly, <laughs> right? I mean, it's very important who you're writing to, and that influences what you say and how comfortable you feel saying it. Now, you love Chaucer. I do. Miller's wife was the aha. Is there oh. one thing that you felt like, oh, oh. this is dreadful? Oh, I, I, I would never admit it on television, because if it ever came back to haunt me. Because you've assigned it so, to your students? <laughs> uh, I, no. Um, no, I'll, I'll never say anything as bad. You can't get me on that one. Is there something uh, I'll that say you... other things are just as good as Chaucer. Okay, let's do that. Okay, Sir Gowan <laughs> and the Green Knight is, I think, the single most impressive piece of literature ever written. And in some ways, I think it's even better than, than Chaucer. Why? But in which ways? Because it's so complex. It's a puzzle for the reader. And it sets up a, a moral trap for Gowan that he doesn't know that he's in. And the reader, does the reader. The reader is not really sure about it either. Right. The reader is experiencing the text in the same way Gowan is. And so I think it's the trickiest way to provide a moral lesson, to ask the reader to go along with Gowan on his adventures and then make the reader face the same aha moment of, of moral failure that Gowan faces. And so it's, it's just an incredibly beautifully written poem, too. Uh, the, the language that it's written in is in a northern dialect of medieval English, and so it's even more difficult than Chaucer's Middle English, and I can only really teach it in translation unless I want to spend the entire semester getting uh, students up for that one dialect. Uh, but, f I mean, for those reasons, it's, it's really my favorite. And it's the text I probably keep returning to over and over in, in my own writing. And that's what we talk about with, with so many of the writers who write about writers, is, right. is to really fully appreciate literature is you can't read it once. No, you're, you're not going to get anything. I mean, I, when I read something for the 37th time, that's, that's when the aha moments sometimes come. Oh, oh I just skimmed past this <laughs> the, the previous 36 times, but now I see it in a new light. And, and that's what's also so great about teaching is that the students bring those moments to you too because they'll see it for, with fresh eyes. And maybe and, point out something that you've missed. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's like a partnership in some ways. You, you sometimes forget how wonderful your partner is, you know, which is a sad thing to say, but it, it just happens Most in relationships, right? And then you have those aha moments of, that, oh yeah, that's why I love you, <laughs> you know, and, and that's why I love these texts, because I always find these moments again and again. So what are you working on now? Is there a project right, right oh, in the works uh, right Oh, well, now? a friend of mine, uh, Lynn Ramey and I, she's at uh, Vanderbilt, we're editing a collection of essays 
called race, class, and gender in medieval cinema. Medieval used, obviously, with quotation marks because there mm -hmm. were no movies made in the Middle <laughs> Ages, but movies about the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at in this collection is the ways in which modern concerns with race, class, and gender are addressed through uh, placing these issues in medieval films. And so my own essay in the piece uh, in the collection is on the Evil Dead movies which is uh, Sam Raimi, of the, he's the director of the Spider-Man. I know, I'm so, I'm so yeah. embarrassed that I, I didn't know oh, who yeah. you were talking about. <laughs> Quite all right. Mm -hmm. uh, but his early movies were Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, and the third one of the trilogy, Army of Darkness, uh, takes the narrative action back in time to Arthurian England. No and one so would believe that, that, that he was versed in that. You know, when you just think, when you're looking at the movie trailer. Well, watch, watch Army of Darkness because I think he I think he had a good education. I think there's a couple of moments that suggest he knew the Miller's Tale. Uh, certainly, he knew Don Quixote. He's playing with Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels. So there's l lots of literary references within his work, and it, it's very self-referential too with other Hollywood genres. I mean, there are references and little. Uh, visual cues to show that he's addressing Wes Craven's movies too. But what I find interesting about his use of the Middle Ages is how the, the male hero of the movies is just so horribly beaten up in the first two films. But then again, going back to the Middle Ages allows him to kind of discover this chivalric masculinity that he can't have in 20th century America. And so then he's able to, to kind of go back to uh, America as a, a conquering hero. And the uh, heroes do get beaten up a lot in medieval literature, they don't do. they? <laughs> they do, but usually they win, too. I mean, the, the, it depends on the fight and the, the text, but, you know, it is this vision of knighthood where the, the one who is on top at any given moment is the one you should root for. So, but it's, it's also, at the same time, it's very individualistic. It is still the Knights of the Round Table for Arthur's court, and a model of knighthood that can be shared, that doesn't have to be, you know, o only blood and guts. Do you think there's anything, and we only have a few few seconds left, but it's uh -huh. a really a hard question to ask you quickly, anything now that in 300 years they'll, they'll, someone will be having an aha moment about? Oh, uh, certainly, and uh, my own bet would be David Sedaris, who's the funniest writer I, I know working today. Uh, he and uh, I think we also have to consider what kind of films and television will be watched 300 years from now. And my money's on John Stewart. Well, great. We're gonna we'll t we'll meet okay. again in 300, 300 years, years, right here. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, let's see if I'm right. <laughs> Dr. Tyson Pugh, thank you so much. Thank you. So it's many things that you have written, I can't even can't even <laughs> name them. Just go on the website and you'll get the links to it. Sure. Thanks for enlightening me. Oh, no problem. <laughs> and I didn't it's, have to run away, run away, run <laughs> away. Run away. Yes. <laughs> I'm Charna Davis Weesey. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on UCF in print.